bedtimes, little kids, folktales. Have you ever told your child a folktale at bedtime? Okay. Sometimes we have those collections, the Mother Goose collections, and um, actually for um, my daughter's kindergarten graduation, she got to play Mother Goose in sort of a, a medley of Mother Goose uh, stories, and uh, we're very proud of her. She did a phenomenal job, and in preparing for this week, it made me think of the folktale Little Red Riding Hood. Does anybody not know the story of Little Red Riding Hood? It's fairly, fairly common. It has a very long history, but in case there's anybody who doesn't remember or doesn't recall, Little Red Riding Hood's mother asked her to go and take a care package to her grandmother. Her grandmother was not well. Her grandmother lived off in the woods, and it was Little Red Riding, Hood, Riding Hood's job to go and to bring her this care package. And before she leaves, Little Red Riding Hood's mom warns her, behave yourself on the way. Do not leave the path. Do not speak to strangers. But on the way, she meets a wolf. And the wolf is very kind and courteous and very cordial. And he says, good day to you, Little Red Riding Hood. Where are you going so early in the morning? And Little Red Riding Hood tells the wolf that she's going to her grandmother's house. He tell, she tells the wolf where her grandmother lives. She tells the wolf that her grandmother is ill. She tells the wolf that why she is going. And the wolf thinks, Man, that would be a very easy, tasty meal. How in the world can I get grandmother when riding, Red Riding Hood's in the way? And so, seeking a means to eat the grandmother, he chooses to deceive and to distract Little Red Riding Hood. He turns her attention to the forest flowers and the birds singing, and he says, why don't you go and take a look? You're walking as though you're going straight to school and you're late for the, for the bus. Why don't you pause? It is very beautiful in the woods. Enjoy the flowers. Why don't you maybe pick a bouquet for grandmother? Flowers always brighten somebody's spirits. And Little Red Riding Hood looks into the woods and she sees the beautiful flowers. Her ears pick up the song of the birds twittering in delight and she goes, yeah, it is beautiful in the woods. And yes, grandmother would like a bouquet. And so she leaves the path going off into the dark woods. And with every flower she picks, she looks up and she sees what may be an even more beautiful and even brighter colored flower off in the distance. And she goes. And she picks enough flowers till her arms are full. And then she realizes the time has passed and she needs to rush to grandmother's house before the care package gets, gets spoiled. Meanwhile, the wolf runs off in front of Little Red Riding Hood. He, gets, he, said, he heads straight to grandmother's house, and he gobbles her up. And then he puts on her robe and pretends to be her waiting for Little Red Riding Hood because he wants dessert. And in the same way that Little Red Riding Hood's mother instructed her to watch out for strangers, to not listen to other voices, to stay on the path, Jesus is telling his followers this morning in these last passages of the Sermon on the Mount, to watch out for strangers, to listen only to the truth, and to stay on his way. And with that, let's read Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29. Jesus speaks, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit, good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Verse 24. 
Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Lord, may we hear your authority today. May we follow along your path. May we build our houses, our lives, upon your rock. Amen. So this week, we're going to take those passages and kind of combine them because what Jesus is doing is really creating this parallelism of this invitation to a choice. And we touched on this a little bit last week with our discussion on the narrow gate and the wide gate, the easy path and the hard path that led to destruction. And here we have that same choice presented. Do we listen to the false prophet or the one who speaks the true words of God? Do we uh, do these marvelous wonders but fail to do the will of our Father in heaven? Will we build our house on the rock of what Jesus has taught, or will we do it on the world's philosophies and the culture's um, teachings and ideologies? And so it's really that same message, that same challenge of who will we follow? How will we build our lives? And here Jesus, as we, if we want to kind of put a frame around it, he talks about the deceivers, and then he talks about the deceived, and then the way through it all. And in thinking about the deceivers, in Matthew 7, 15, he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And, and for those of you who may not be aware, prophets were those individuals that were called to stand between God and God's people and to declare God's word or God's message to them. Often, the message was either an encouragement to continue following in the ways of Yahweh, or a challenge to return to the ways of Yahweh. They were, if you will, kind of covenant um, watchdogs or uh, lawyers. They would stand before the people and say, this is what you're doing, but this is how it is different from what God has commanded. Return to the ways of God, lest the judgment of God come upon you, because God is faithful to his word. And the true, to be a true prophet was not a desirable job. Because you See, it was very difficult. It was a thankless job. Jeremiah was thrown into a pit. Isaiah was rejected by his people. Ezekiel is um, sent into Babylonian exile. And it was on his 30th birthday where God starts to speak to him and say, look at all the transgressions. Look at all of the idolatry that's happening back in Jerusalem still today. Kings did not want to hear God's truthful words because they had stopped following Yahweh for much of Israel and Judah's history, and instead they would seek false prophets, those individuals that would speak a word for the king and would tickle their ears, so to speak. You see, often when people stop following Yahweh and his voice becomes dull in our ears, God will send prophets, but because our ears have grown dull, we don't want to hear what God is truly saying. And so false prophets will come, and they speak in God's name, but they do not speak God's words. And what happens in Israel's history is often these kings who are not following God, they listen to the false prophets, and it always ends badly. Perhaps the greatest example is King Ahab in 1 Kings 22. He wants to go to war. He invites the king of Judah to come, and he says, hey, and the king of Judah says, well, can we consult, you know, God, can we consult the prophets? And Ahab says, great, I have 400 of them. Okay, one, if you have 400 people that tell you the exact same thing, you need to find a different voice. And that's what King Jehoshaphat does. He says, let's find a different voice. Is there a prophet of Yahweh whom we can hear? And Ahab goes, well, yeah, there's Micaiah, but he never says anything good about me. 
well, Ahab, have you ever done anything good to begin with, right? And Micaiah comes, and he even plays into the whole thing, and he says, oh yeah, go up to battle, and um, you, the Lord will bring you victory. And Ahab goes, will you stop teasing me? Please tell me what God has told you. And he says, if you go to battle, your army will be defeated, and you will die. And that's that famous story where one of uh, Ahab's 400 prophets comes up and slaps Micaiah in the, in the face and says, how did the spirit go from me into you? And um, Ahab doesn't listen to Micaiah, the true prophet of Yahweh. Instead, he listens to his 400 prophets. He goes to battle and the army loses. Ahab dies. And that leads the question as we come back to our text in Matthew, because to listen to a false prophet will lead to our destruction and to our death. And so the question is, how can we know when a prophet is true? And the tests in Scripture, and we see these in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18, the tests are, one, do their words come true? Now understand, for some uh, prophecies, say the, um, Jeremiah, who declared 70 years of exile, you could be sitting on year 65 and going, man, I don't know if this is going to come true. There, there are times where the fulfillment ec- comes beyond the, ex- the span of our lives. And that's where we can go to the second test. The first one is, do the words come true? But the second test is more important. Does it lead the people further into faithfulness and relationship with God through, and in our New Testament age through Jesus Christ? Or does it lead the people away from God? That's the key test. Because even in the Old Testament, they recognize that, yes, signs and wonders can happen. And yes, what um, false prophets say did sometimes happen. But then the, the true test was, are, is it leading the people into faithfulness or away from faithfulness to Yahweh? And that's why Jesus calls the false prophets these sheep-clad wolves. They come dressed as in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And in John chapter 10, Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd. Well, sheep follow a shepherd, and so if we follow Jesus, we are his sheep. And here in Matthew, he's warning us that some of the sheep aren't really sheep. Some of the sheep are like the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood. They've put on a woolen robe, and yet we can, like Little Red Riding Hood, look and we can see that there are little bits and pieces of their wolfness that sticks out. You know the story. Little Red Riding Hood goes up to her grandmother's bed and goes, Oh, grandmother, what big ears you have. And the false prophets, just like the wolf, will come up with excuses. Oh, all the better to hear you with. Oh, grandmother, what big eyes you have. Well, well, all the better to see you with, my dear. Oh, grandmother, what big hands you have. Oh, all the better to embrace you with, my dear. But the signs of the wolf cannot be covered. Oh, grandmother, what a horribly big mouth and teeth you have. And here's where the truth comes out. All the better to eat you with. And at that moment in the story of Little Red Riding Hood, the wolf jumps out of bed, grabs Little Red Riding Hood, and gobbles her up. And if we are not careful, we can can fall prey to false prophets. And in fact, if you look through church history, we see time and time again, people coming up, people proclaiming a false gospel, leading people into death and destruction, even mass suicide. We need to be aware of the false prophets and we need to have our eyes open as followers of Jesus. And when we see a misshapen sheep, we have to pause and go, oh, what, what big egos you have. That doesn't sound like the way of Jesus. Oh, well, you know, I, I've been called to leadership and I've been doing all this wonderful stuff. Oh, okay, that's interesting. But my, what, what big boasts you have. You, you talk a lot about how you pray and how you fast and how you do these things. Well, I'm, and the excuse will come. I said, oh, my, what, what being tempers you have. You, you were really kind to the people at first, but now all of a sudden you're being really mean and oppressive and, and really forcing your way on people. We can see those signs. Or as Jesus says, you can tell a tree by its fruit. And so I want to play a little game called the fruit tree game. And uh, we're going to put a picture up of a tree, and I want you to tell me what kind of tree is in the picture. Ready, set, Go. What kind of tree is that? Yeah. Apple tree, right? I know it's a little hard for, uh, with the distance and the screen for, for some of you, but yeah, that's an apple tree. Okay, next one. 
Okay, orange tree, absolutely. And the next one. Banana, okay, 100%. Last Easter I did this, but it was the seed game, and we got like zero out of zero, or zero out of 10. Do you remember that? Because it's hard to identify a fruit by its seed. We have an apple seed, a banana, or orange seed, and banana seeds there, and honestly, if I'm in the store, and they're not labeled, and I'm trying to figure out what to plant, I have no idea what these are going to become. I'm not a botanist. I don't know. I, I went to Michigan State, but not their agricultural school, okay? Right? I went to the music school. I can, I can tell you what the dots on the line mean. Um, and, but we go, well, maybe, maybe the leaves are a little bit easier. You know, we know a maple leaf. We know an oak leaf. But even the leaves, and I understand these pictures aren't to scale, so a banana leaf is huge, and that might be a little bit easier to identify. But look at the apple and the orange leaves. They're quite similar. And if you just found a leaf on the ground and picked it up, you wouldn't, it would be very difficult to know what it is. And if it happened to be from the wrong plant, you might get really itchy later on, right? Poison yeah. <laughs> Stay away from the three-leafed vine, okay? And I want you to know what Jesus is doing here is he's not just using an agricultural metaphor because anybody that he's sitting on the mountain with him, hearing his teaching, they could look out to the olive groves and go, oh yeah, yeah, I'm not going to, if I go to an olive tree, I'm not going to get a grape or whatever else. I can tell an olive tree by the olives and a grapevine from its grapes. But he's actually tying into this theme that we find in scripture of how humans are uh, related to trees throughout scripture. And so when you go back to Genesis chapter 1 in the creation narrative, um, the first three days of creation parallel the second three days of creation. So on days 3 and on day 6, there are actually two acts of creation. And the second act on um, day 3 is the trees springing forth from the ground. The second act on day 6 are human beings being created out of the dust of the earth. And so there's a parallel there. Both trees and humans have seed within them, the ability to produce life, the next generation. Both trees and humans are commanded to bear fruit, in which is their seed. God plants the humans, that's actually the Hebrew word in Genesis chapter 2, God plants the humans in the garden and the trees are planted in the garden. And then throughout the Bible, language is used that would normally be attributed to trees in describing humans. They grow, they are uprooted, they are planted, they are, uh, they are cut down. And so Jesus is drawing on this whole theme through the Old Testament to highlight how we can identify those who are truly followers of Yahweh and those who are faking it. And maybe the clearest example of this is uh, Psalm chapter 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. And here the psalmist is actually combining another metaphor where um, God is the one who gives life, the river of life that comes from the throne of heaven, the four rivers in the Garden of Eden that would uh, converge to bring life into all the world. So those who follow in God's way, who meditate on God's law, they plant themselves by God's life and they can bear God's fruit. In all that he does, he prospers. Their fruit is born in season, and its leaf does not wither. Coming back to Matthew chapter 7, we can take this idea then that Jesus is drawing on throughout the Old Testament, and we go, okay, so if we can recognize them by their fruits, the healthy tree has to be planted by the healthy source of water, it has to be planted in healthy soil, has to have the nutrients that uh, it needs to bear good fruit. The diseased tree is the tree that is away from the things that are healthy. It has embraced death. You could even imagine in Jesus' teaching, the people imagining, here's the tree of life, and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And one is full of life, and, wants to, and that is the tree that we want to see replicated throughout the world. The other is the tree of death. And so he's presenting before the people a choice between life and death. 
This is judgment text. This is an invitation to choose the narrow gate or the wide gate, the difficult path or the easy path. And this is centered around our actions, around our doings. You see, the, the word bears or bearing in this passage, and it comes a number of times, is from the same Greek word that is translated in other places, and actually most often in Scripture, the verb do. And so you could imagine the phrase bear good fruit equaling do good works. And the works are the things that Jesus has been describing, what we've been talking about in the first half of this year through the Sermon on the Mount. As Michael Wilkins says, so Jesus calls his disciples to evaluate carefully any prophets who come into their community, not only to look at their message, to see if it is consistent with the narrow way advocated by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, but also to look at their works, to see if their lives are consistent with the kingdom life of righteousness that Jesus has advocated. And every tree that does not bear good fruit will get cut down. That's what John the Baptist said when he uh, was giving his message. And uh, Matthew 3, 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, for he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Those are two different two different ends based on the choice that we, that we make as we conf are confronted by the truth of Jesus. His winnowing fork is in his hand. There's a discernment for those who come to him. He will clear his threshing floor and gather its, his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. In Matthew chapter 5, we saw that those who uh, consist in anger are liable to the hell of fire. It's the same kind of judgment imagery and how we respond to what Jesus has been teaching. And the response must require action. Will we do the things that Jesus has called us to do? And I mentioned already that there is a parallelism in these texts. We have four choices presented, and the results of those four choices are either life in the kingdom or life outside of the kingdom, which is destruction and judgment. And so we will recognize these prophets by their fruit. How are they living? How are they treating other people? Are they praying for the people who many would consider their enemies? Are they, are they seeking the well-being of the person across from them? So Jesus here has helped us identify the wolves that may be around us. If you see a sheep chasing and biting other sheep, chances are it is not a sheep, right? Last year, when we were going through 1 John, we, we did the duck test. If it looks like a duck, if it sounds like a duck, it probably is a duck. If it acts like a wolf and snarls like a wolf and bites like a wolf, it's probably a wolf. And no matter how much fleece it's hiding under, it can't hide what's truly in its heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And so just like when we hear someone else telling their child that their zipper is down, and you discreetly go around the corner and you check your own zipper, uh, the, the, our response to what Jesus is saying, hey, beware of the fruit of false prophets, should also have a reflective effect on our lives. God, what is the fruit that my life is producing? Am I following in your way, or do I need to do some pruning? Do I need to allow you to come in and do some pruning in me? What are our lives producing? Are they producing the works of the kingdom, love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, or the works of the world? And as we discussed last week, this is of paramount importance. Because we can live one way, say, but say something else to the point where we believe what we say, even though our lives don't match up to it. And this is where we get into the discussion of the deceived in Matthew 21, or 7, 21 to 23. And we've covered this quite a bit last week, so I don't want to spend too much time here. But we can confess, Lord, Lord, yes, Jesus is on the throne, but then our lives have not conformed to his way. The deceivers are themselves deceived. 
And not only that, but they can deceive other people. Or as Scott McKnight says, the false prophets either petition Jesus or confess him as Lord. They support themselves by appealing to their prophecies, exorcisms, and miracle working. But Jesus counters that they don't do God's will and are evildoers. These people, in other words, deceive themselves into thinking they are kingdom people because of the gifts they have performed. And as we talked about last week, that's a very dangerous place for people to be and something that many people especially in the charismatic pentecostal traditions have fallen into michael wilkins reminds us that jesus never emphasizes the external as being the highest sign of authenticity it's not about how we sound when we pray it's not about how uh, how many people get healed when we lay hands on them but it's always been about our inward allegiance to god's will where is our heart I just said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And out of our heart, the fruit of the kingdom will be produced. And so the charismatic signs aren't enough. Instead, we seek after the will of our Father who is in heaven. And what is that will? Well, it's contrasted with works of lawlessness or to be without law. And as we talked about last year, we are under a kingdom with a king who has declared his law to us. And it's the law and the prophets that Jesus has come to fulfill. It is the golden rule, doing unto others as we would have done unto ourselves. It is loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving others as we love ourselves. That is the work of God. That is the fruit of God in our lives. And so we pursue those things because it reveals a heart that is truly submitted under God. Those who don't do that, their end is judgment. They are Jesus tells them, I don't know you. Be gone from me. Their path leads to destruction. Their house will fall. They will be cast into burning fire with gnashing of teeth. Now, like Little Red Riding Hood, they were at the risk of being deceived by the deceiver, and the wolf gobbled them up. And that's exactly where some of the early versions of Little Red Riding Hood end. Do you want to end on a bad note? With the wolf victorious and the only thing we can carry away is a moral? No, because we believe in the God who is merciful and God who is gracious and the God who sent his son to die on our behalf to conquer the wolf, to split him open, to pull us out so that we can have a fresh lease on life. And so there are other versions of Little Red Riding Hood where there's a woodcutter. And after the wolf has eaten grandma and Little Red Riding Hood, he takes a nap and he's snoring so loudly. Have you ever had a post-nap snore? right? Has anybody woken you because of your post-nap snore? But the woodcutter hears, and he comes, and he thinks, there might be time to save grandma in Little Red Riding Hood, and so he cuts open the wolf's belly and pulls her out, and they're like, oh, thank goodness, we're saved, and, and then the way the, the um, Brother Grimm's version goes is they load his belly with stones. Somehow they sew him up. I don't know how he survived that surgery, And then when the wolf wakes up, he can't move because the stones are so heavy in him, and then he dies. It was gruesome. But I want want us to know that, that God has given us a woodcutter, Jesus Christ. And even though the enemy will try to deceive us, he will try to devour us, God is faithful. He has defeated the enemy. He has freed us. He shows us the way forward. He puts the light upon our path. We can follow him in his ways. And no matter how many wolves or false prophets come, we know what is true and we can follow after it. And that is exactly what Little Red Riding Hood learned. As she goes home after this ordeal with the wolf, she says, as long as I live, I will never leave the path and run off into the woods by myself if mother tells me not to. In Charles Perrault's version, Um, the the sad version that ends with the wolf winning, uh, he explains the moral this way. From this story, one learns that children, especially young lasses, pretty, courteous, and well-bred, remember he's from like the 16th century, do very wrong to listen to strangers, and it is not an unheard of thing if the wolf is thereby provided with his dinner. In other words, if we don't listen to our mothers, if we follow after the, the false things that we hear, it can lead to our death. But Paul continues, I say wolf, for all wolves are not of the same sort. There is one kind with an amenable disposition, 
neither noisy nor hateful nor angry, but tame, obliging, gentle, following the young maids in the streets, even into their homes. Alas, who does not know that these gentle wolves are of all such creatures the most dangerous? Notice his emphasis on the gentle wolves as the most dangerous ones. They are the sheep, or the wolves in sheep's clothing. They are the ones who will try to work in, and they might be and they might appear for a time to be the most gracious, the most kind, the most generous, but there's something sinister in their motives. We, we, we hear about trafficking in our world, and um, traffickers don't show their wolfness right out in the beginning, or they'll never get people to, to buy into their lies. But there's that season of grooming that they have to do first. It's horrible. It's and when you find out about it, it, it breaks your heart. And, and it's just, it's one of the worst evils that we can imagine. And yet, that's what the enemy will often try to do. It won't just be a wolf standing along the path. But the enemy will try to place the wolves in sheep's clothing to try to distract us and to try to bait us into thinking, no, this, he is faithful, he is truthful, he, he does really nice things. He, you know, I, I know there's this weird thing that he, you know, this weird tick or, or you know, we called we caught him, kind of caught him by surprise, and all of a sudden, he's acting in a very strange way. But those are all those little signs that we are called to watch out for. And so we might say the moral of Little Red Riding Hood this way, as long as we live, we will never listen to strangers or those who preach a strange gospel, false prophets, false teachers. We will never leave the way of Jesus we will hear the words and do them. And that's the way that we can make it through. That's the way through it all. Hearing and doing the words of Jesus. And that's where we come to the parable of the buildings, the building on the rock and the building on the sand in Matthew 7, 24 to 27. The aim here, again, is the doing part. What we do, those who hear and do, those who hear and do. Ten times we see that verb do. Sometimes it's translated bear, as we talked about in the previous paragraph. And the challenge here for, that Jesus is giving is sometimes we can, <clears throat> we can do things that are good, but they are not the things that are God. And so a builder in ancient Palestine, and remember Jesus is by the shores of uh, the Sea of Galilee as he's speaking from the mountain, and uh, on those shores was what they called uh, alluvial sand. And it was this very hard surface sand, and during the hot summer months, it would feel pretty packed down. And somebody could, you know, especially if you were a novice builder, or you're just trying to, to save time and save costs, you would think, you know what, it, this, it's hard enough, I can, I can build my house on this and we'll be okay. But that's during the dry summer months where the sand will harden and compact. When the calendar flips and the winter comes and the rains begin to pour and the Jordan rises and, and cr crosses flood stage, all of a sudden that sand isn't hard anymore. But it becomes muck and mud and it gets washed away and with it goes the house. And so instead, a builder worth his own would dig down sometimes up to 10 feet. That's a lot of work. Right? I, when we put the mailbox in, uh, I think Eli and I, we dug, what, four feet? Okay, and, I'm, and that, that was enough work in, in and of itself. So thinking, digging down 10 feet to get to bedrock, and they start building on the bedrock. And when you build on the bedrock, when the wind and the waves and the storms come, the house stands because the ground under it can't get washed away. And we even use that in modern building. Growing up by excuse me, um, I grew up by um, Eastern and 68th Street, and that's right around where M6 was going through. So when I'm in middle school, they were building M6, and we could hear them build at the um, interchange of 131 and M6. And I think my dad told me, like, there were 27 bridges in that one interchange. So there was a lot of stuff happening there. And to make sure that those bridges had a firm foundation, for months on end, we would hear this, Ping, 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 eight, 12 hours a day, weeks on end. And they were, what they were doing is they had these giant pile drivers. 
and they were driving these I-beam pylons hundreds of feet into the ground until it hit bedrock because they knew if they didn't hit bedrock, then the bridge would not be supported and lives would be in danger. If we're not building our lives on the bedrock foundation of Jesus Christ, then the people who are looking to us, who are looking to see what is the gospel like, what is the truth of Jesus Christ, what does redemption really look like, what is, is forgiveness possible, then their lives are at danger and our lives are at danger of being swept away. And so the wise build on a firm foundation of God's word. The wind, the rain, the floods of life cannot knock our houses over Because we have trusted in the truth of Jesus. We have trusted in the thing that cannot change, no matter what happens in our world and in our culture. Like those who enter the narrow gate and took the hard way, or those who bore good fruit, and those who do the will of our Father in heaven, these people will stand in the final judgment. The foolish, on the other hand, build on a weak foundation. They build on the sand that gets washed away when the wind and the rain and the floods come, and their homes and their lives get destroyed. And we've seen some of that in our own family members as they've strayed from the way. And like those who took the wide gate and the easy path to their destruction, or those who bore bad fruit and were chopped down and burned in the fire, or those who may have gone and even done great signs and wonders, but not the will of our Father in heaven, they are commanded to depart, and they will fall in the final judgment. What we do matters, and Jesus is presenting that challenge to his people. Because hearing that does not lead to doing is totally useless. How many of you have ever heard your alarm clock and did not get out of bed? Right? How many of you have called in sick to work because you, cho you did not listen to your alarm clock? Back when I was in college, I did that once or twice. But Lord, please forgive me. Right? Or maybe even worse, maybe even more life-threatening, uh, there are stories of people who hear the tornado alarm, the tornado siren, and they know they should duck for cover, but they don't listen, and their houses and their lives get destroyed. We can hear the alarm of what Jesus is saying, but if we don't act in response to that alarm, then what Jesus says is useless. It requires a response. And so McKnight summarizes we come to the end of this sermon and the invitation, the summons, or the challenge of Jesus is not simply to accept him or to believe in him as though rational acceptance were his fundamental mission. He's not saying, will you just acknowledge that I lived and I said some stuff? Jesus wants more. McKnight continues, the fun fundamental aim of the sermon is to present Jesus and his kingdom vision for his kingdom people. And the only accurate or acceptable response to his sermon is to embrace him, to accept the challenge. That means to do what he says. That's why we end with the king's authority. Matthew 7, 28 and 29, when Jesus finished these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not like their scribes. Throughout Matthew, we see Jesus pictured as a new Moses. Even here in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes up a mountain. He receives the law of God. He shares the law of God to God's people, and he establishes God's reign and rule over them again. That's what Moses was doing on Mount Sinai. And then in Deuteronomy 18, Moses tells the people, hey, there will be a prophet like me that God will raise from among you. You shall listen to him. And Jesus is basically saying, I am that prophet. Listen to me. Do the things that I have called you to do because we have a whole long history in Israel of not doing the things Yahweh has said and we know how that goes. I am presenting to you another opportunity to follow in the ways of God. Will you do it? Will you do it? Will you be like Little Red Riding Hood who hears the words of her mother and listens do you know that there was a part two of Little Red Riding Hood? There is. There was a sequel. In the sequel, Little Red Riding Hood has learned from the first one, which is always a good thing, right? We don't want to repeat the same mistakes over and over. And so she 
is asked to take another care package to her grandmother, and her mother tells her again, stay along the path, do not listen to any other voices, go straight to your grandmother's house. Again, she's on the path. Another wolf comes up, asks her to leave the path, tries to distract her, tries to deceive her, tries to get her off from the goal of her life and the mission that she's out to do. And this is where the story changes. Little Red Riding Hood goes straight to her grandmother's house. She does not veer off into the woods. She does not listen to the wolves. She makes zero detours. She gets to her grandmother's house and she warns her grandmother. When we find wolves in our lives, we need to warn the people around us, hey, that person is not to be trusted. She warns her grandmother who has her lock the door so the wolf can't get in. When the wolf comes up, he's failed at deception one, so he tries deception two. He's banging on the door and saying, oh, grandmother, it's Little Red Riding Hood. And he probably sounded that terrible, okay? And grandmother cannot be deceived because Little Red Riding Hood is sitting next to her on the couch, right? The wolf's plots will fail. And so he thinks, okay, strike one, strike two. I got one more chance, third time's a charm. So what he does is he climbs on the roof of grandmother's house and he's waiting for Little Red Riding Hood to have to go home. And that way he can jump off the roof, roof, pounce on her, and then turn around and get grandma. But grandma's not fooled. Little Red Riding Hood isn't fooled. Grandma just happened to be boiling sausage the day before. And so she tells Little Red Riding Hood, hey, go and grab the leftover broth from the, from the sausage and go pour it in the trough outside. And the wolf starts to smell. Ooh, Italian. I like that. And he starts to lean over the, the eave of the roof to get more and more of the smell. And he's trying to hold on while he's also trying to go and, and smell this broth. And eventually he leans so far over, he loses his grip and he falls into the trough and he drowns. He dies. And then Little Red Riding Hood skips home happily ever after. Why? Because she listened to what was true. She stayed on the path that led her to her grandmother's house. And when we put God's words into practice, it's like Little Red Riding Hood part two. We trust in the goodness of God and in the goodness of the things he tells us in his word. We follow in the ways of Jesus. We're able to spot the false prophets. We're able to recognize those false teachers right away. We ignore their deceptions. We don't listen to their voices. We stay on the straight and narrow. We stay laser focused on the things of Jesus. We push past every distraction on the path. And then we can warn others with the truth that we have received. This is the way. Follow in it. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to that. And throughout the sermon, Jesus then is asking us, will we be like Little Red Riding Hood part two? Will we listen to his words? Will we follow in his ways? Will we build our lives on his firm foundation? Will we stay on the road that has been built with the pylons going down to the bedrock so that even when the wind and the waves come, we're not going to shake like those bridges we see on the world's worst catastrophe videos. But we'll be able to cross the path and reach our goal the kingdom of God, life with him in eternity. And so we ask about the gates and roads that we've chosen. Will we enter the gate of life into the kingdom of heaven and embark on a life of following Jesus? Or will we reject Jesus for the popular and easy road that will eventually lead to destruction? Will we find Jesus in the inner source of transformation that produces good fruit in our lives? Or will we follow the voices of our world, the hype of our culture, a life that promises good but can only lead to fire? Will we obey the Father's will and will we do the things that Jesus said? Or will we chase after false manifestations of spirituality and be banished from him forever? Will we build our lives on the rock of his word? Or will we build it on the sand of pleasant ease and be unprepared for the storms that come? Will we submit to the authority of King Jesus? Or will we submit to the authority of the world? Are we with Jesus or are we against him?
Are we clear about the consequences of our choices? Because even as followers of Jesus here and today, there will be moments and times and seasons in our lives that will be difficult, that will challenge our commitment. For some, it's the, the cost of martyrdom. Will I give my physical life? For some, it's the cost of family. Will I endure the rejection of family members because I've committed to the way of Jesus and I'm going to show them and model for them what that looks like, even though they have rejected it? For some, it's, will I give up a promotion or financial security because I have followed in the ways of Jesus and I will not, I, I will not take advantage of customers or will not take advantage of the loopholes in the law or whatever it may be and commit illicit business practice. What we do matters. And while one's, one action may not lead us into destruction, repeated action will continue to carry us further and further away until eventually we have reached a destination we did not intend to. And so the challenge this morning is having heard Jesus' message in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, but I say unto you, but we embrace the I say unto you, and in doing so fulfill the law and the prophets with him. And it wouldn't be right of me to offer that challenge to the followers of Jesus. If there's someone here who said, you know, I've been on the fence and I don't know, or, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been doing all the, all the good things, but I've never actually committed. I've never actually believed in his resurrection, made him Lord and King. I just tried to do enough good that he would say, okay, you get a passing grade. And I just want to offer the invitation this morning as we've heard the words of Jesus to make him king, to believe that he died for us in our sins, that he forgave us of all that we have done to harm others and to harm ourselves, that he is giving us new life and he has called us to follow in him because he is the way to life. And I implore you, make that decision this morning if you haven't already. If you have, then I implore you, recommit to that decision. Say, Jesus, I know how easy it is to start to wander. I know how easy it is to start to listen to these other voices. But Jesus, I'm recommitting this morning saying, I am following you and I'm going to abide by your word. And God, I, ad I admit it is hard. So give me strength. It is a challenge. So give me courage. We trust in you, Jesus. And if you've made those decisions, I want to hear from you and we want to pray with you and walk with you in those, in those steps. And so the question is, what do we do? Who will we follow? Are we Little Red Riding Hood Part 1 or Little Red Riding Hood Part 2? Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask, Lord Jesus, in your grace, that you would give us the strength and the courage to follow after you, to hear your word, to build our lives on your foundation. God, not only does that provide security for us, but it can provide sanctuary for the people around us who are in a world that is, that is just being rocked by winds and waves and of, of culture and ideology and, and philosophy. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be that, just those outposts of your kingdom that are firmly founded so that as family members, as friends, as co-workers, as neighbors come and say, how can you have such peace in a world that has gone astray? We can say it is because our lives are founded on the rock of Christ Jesus. We have listened to what he has said, and we have not strayed from that path, and we invite you to come along with us. God, we pray it over our young people, those who are coming through school and going off to college. We pray it over those who are in their careers and may be tempted by the lures of, of money and finances and a promotion. God, we pray it over those who are entering into retirement years and wondering, is there, is there still purpose or, or, or reason for me? There is absolutely. God, we are yours, and we commit our lives to you. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we bless you. And I speak the blessing of Christ Jesus over you this morning as we go and we follow along his way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance over you and give you peace. And I came across this the other day. I want to just add this. In Psalm 67, it 
May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Direct parallel to the blessing from Numbers chapter 6. But then this is where the psalmist goes. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, and your, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase, God. Our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So as you go in the blessings of our Lord, know that you are going as a blessing to the nations. We bless you, church.